Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of today's video is the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, we are now in lesson two of the unit schedule, so please have a look at that and also take a look at the learning goals and success criteria as well as the questions that we're going to answer. Pause the video now and do that. Okay, thanks, and you're back, and we're going to dive right into this topic. Uh, we've already learned what momentum is in the previous video. We learned that momentum equals mass times velocity for any object. But now things get interesting because we're going to start talking about collisions. And uh, the thing about collisions, which in the, in the traditional sense of the word, for example, let's say this player over here tackling that player over there, is that when collisions happen, interesting things result. Uh, in football, of course, the tackle happens and the play will stop. Maybe a touchdown will be prevented. Or maybe this guy will break free and score. So there's entertainment value. But another example of a collision could be a car crash where, of course, very bad things could happen. Or maybe a collision could be the collision of hydrogen and oxygen atoms forming water, which is usually a good thing, right? So when we talk about collisions, we're really analyzing all of the things that can happen in nature uh, that, that really determine what the universe around us looks like. Uh, sometimes when we say collision, we don't actually mean two things are colliding. For example, we might actually just be talking about this term, an interaction of some sort. An interaction where forces are exerted. And if you take a look at the, uh, at the picture, that I have of an explosion here, you'll see what I mean. Even though there's not necessarily a collision going on here, I mean maybe this explosion was caused by a bomb blowing up as opposed to two things colliding, we still in physics kind of put them in the same category as collisions because there's an interaction, forces are being exerted between multiple objects and as you're going to see, when that's the situation, we have a very powerful principle or law in physics which allows us to make predictions about the motion that results. So first of all, what are the physics ideas that apply? Well, let's look back at the football collision here. First of all, it's pretty clear that forces are exerted. And they are exerted, of course, between objects. And if that's the case, for example, if the white player here and the green player there are exerting forces, let, let's sort of analyze this in terms of the physics that we know to see what's going on. You could say that the white-shirted player is exerting a force. Let's call it the force of white on the green-shirted player, G. However, as we know from Newton's third law, N3 as I like to write it, if the white-shirted player exerts a force on the green-shirted player, then it is also true that the green-shirted player exerts a force on the white-shirted player. You can't have one without the other. It's Newton's third law, the law of action and reaction. And there's actually a formula that relates these two because there has to be that equal and opposite characteristic of these two forces. And we'll get to that very, very shortly. This is one physics idea I want you to keep in mind during collisions. The other one is that when the forces are exerted, there is a certain amount of time that elapses. Time during which forces are exerted. There we go. The white-shirted player exerts a force for a certain amount of time on the green-shirted player, and Newton's third law tells us that they exert a force back on the white-shirted player. However, for however long that takes, it has to be the same for both players. I know this sounds kind of obvious, but the times being the same is going to be important in very shortly on the next screen when I do a little derivation here. So the time during which forces are exerted is the same. for all objects. Running out of room there. There we go. Okay, keep these two thoughts in mind and now let's look at a situation. We're going to analyze a collision in one dimension and so to set this up, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to imagine an air hockey table. We've all played air hockey or at least seen it at some point 
you got one puck that's moving along and it's going to collide with another puck. Suppose these pucks are given the names M1 and M2 to indicate mass number one and mass number two. Now, as I'm drawing in some, uh, some symbols here, I want you to think about what air hockey looks like. Two people stand at opposite ends of the table and they hit the pucks toward one another. After they hit them, the pucks glide frictionlessly across the table. There is no force pushing them forward or backward anymore. There's no friction and they don't have their own propulsion systems. What we're going to do is analyze the collision of these two objects, not including you getting them started moving. We're going to look at the collision from once you already have the pucks moving and they are no longer experiencing an applied force. So they've got M1 has a, a velocity V1 and it's heading toward M2 which has a velocity V2. And this of course is before the collision. Now after the collision, let's think about what could happen. Obviously these two objects are not going to exit the collision the same way they came into it. Their velocities have to change because they're going to experience forces. Pause the video in a moment and see if you can predict what are some of the possible outcomes for the velocity vectors for these two masses. Please do that now. Okay, and you're back and let's think about what could happen. Well, one thing that seems kind of likely is maybe M1 reverses direction and M2 reverses direction. Maybe what happens is this, M1 with the velocity vector that way, M2 with the velocity vector that way. We would call these V1 prime, or apostrophe, prime meaning final velocity, and V2 prime meaning final velocity. This is one option, I'll call it option A. Uh, here's another option that maybe you thought of. Maybe they both stop cold. Maybe it's kind of like if you've ever watched a hockey game where two players collide at center ice, sometimes they just stop and they drop to the ice. Uh, here's another possibility. Maybe one of the objects overpowers the other and keeps going in the same direction. So maybe V1 has more, let's call it power for now, even though that's not exactly what it is. But let's say V1 overpowers, uh, sorry, M1 overpowers M2 and they both end up going this way, so that here's V1 prime and here's V2 prime. Or maybe the reverse happens. Maybe it's M2 that overpowers M1 and they both go this way. All of these are possibilities and we're going to develop a mathematical equation to help us predict which one is going to happen. All right, now, uh, We've talked about the before, we've talked about after. The interesting thing, however, is what's happening in the middle. And so this is what I'd like you to focus on now. In the middle, when these two objects are in contact, it's kind of like here, where these two guys are in contact. This is where all of the things that are important in determining the outcome will occur. And let's see what those things are. So we've got M1 and we've got M2. Now, I want you to pause the video in a second and do the following. Draw a free body diagram for M1 and draw a free body diagram for M2 during the interaction or collision. Please do that now. Okay, and you're back. What did you get? Well, first of all, you should definitely have things like the force of gravity and the force of the air pushing up on those air hockey pucks. So let's call these FG1, and, sorry, not FG, that would be down as FG. This is the air pushing up on object one, and this is FG1. And here's FG2, and here's F air 2. Uh, this should equal that if the puck is floating, just hovering over the tabletop, and this should equal that I give these double ticks and those single ticks because there's no guarantee these masses are equal and so there's no guarantee that the forces are equal. Uh, what else? Well, number one is bumping into number two and therefore pushing it to the right. I'll put this in another color so you can see it. 
what would we call this? This is the force of 1 bumping into 2, so F1 on 2. Now, 2 is also bumping into 1, so there's got to be a force this way, and we would call that F2 on 1. And here's the thing that I want you to remember that we discussed back here. What physics ideas apply? Well, when objects collide and exert forces, Newton's third law applies. Equal and opposite reactions. So over here, we can say for sure that this force, I'll give it a triple tick mark, and that force are equal. In fact, we can write that F2 on 1 is equal to F1 on 2, but in the opposite direction, so negative. And this is very important. We're going to have to remember this, so let's highlight it. Don't want to forget that. It's very important for the analysis. Uh, what other forces? Is there any friction? I hope you didn't put friction here because I said before we're on an air hockey table and therefore there's little or no friction. We can ignore that. I hope you did not put an applied force on your free body diagram because I also told you that the player, the, hockey, the air hockey player, hits the puck to give it its initial velocity but after that, you don't push anymore. You let them go collide. Nothing is pushing them forward. So these are the forces, and now watch what we can do. I'm going to take you through a derivation of an important physics principle. We know that these two forces are equal and opposite. We also know that they are the net force. F net on object 1 is equal to F2 on 1. The reason for that is, if air and gravity balance, all that's left is this. We also know that F net on 2 is equal to F1 on 2. So if these two are equal except for a negative sign, then their net forces are equal except for a negative sign. So we can write the following, M1 times A1 equals the negative of M2, A2. And now, acceleration, if you recall, is a final velocity, so that'll be a prime, a V1 prime minus a V1 over a time. And this will be equal to the negative of M2 of V2 prime, a final velocity for, v, for object number 2, minus V2, the initial velocity, over the time. And now let's think back to the physics ideas that apply. We said the time during which the collision occurs is the same for both, the time during which the forces are exerted. So that means that over here we're going to cross out the time at the bottom. And that's just going to leave us with this, the numerator essentially here, which is going to be what? Let's expand these brackets m1 v1 prime minus m1 v1 equals negative m2 v2 prime minus minus would be plus m2 v2. Now I've run out of space here so I'll continue on another page. Here we go. Let's just continue this. What do we got? What is this? This is the mass times final velocity of object 1. So that's a P1 prime. This is a mass times velocity of object 1, so it's a P1. Similarly, this is negative P2 prime, and this is positive P2. Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the prime uh, momentum values onto one side and the unprime momentum values onto the other side. And what am I going to get? P1 prime plus P2 prime equals P1 plus P2. What do you get when you add up two final values? You get the total final value. What do you get when you add up two initial values? You get the total initial value. This is telling us the following. 
the initial momentum equals the final momentum. In other words, there's no change in total momentum of the system of objects if, big if here, let's look back at where this all came from. We assumed an air hockey table, which means friction equal to zero. We assumed that you already pushed on the objects and are no longer pushing on them, and so the applied force is zero. We assumed that gravity and the air were balanced. In other words, there is no net external force on this system. So there's no change in total momentum of system if F net external equals zero. And that, my friends, is what we call the law of conservation of momentum or as I like to write it because I'm lazy, locom. So let's see if we can apply this to a textbook question. Here's a question out of your textbook. It's Physics 12 by Nelson, and it's in section 5.2. It's one of the sample problems. A vacationer, 75 kilograms, is standing on a raft, 55 kilograms, as you see in the diagram here. Not moving, stationary. All of a sudden, he begins walking to the right with a speed of 2.3 meters per second. What's going to happen to the raft? Well, pause the video for a moment and see if you can predict what will happen. If you've ever been on a raft or if you've stood up in a canoe, or even the same thing kind of happens if you're standing on uh, something like a skateboard and you start walking one way, what's going to happen? Pause the video and predict. Okay, and you're back. And if you predicted that as the walker ends up going forward, he's going to exert forces backward on the raft, which will cause it to go backward, then you've made a correct prediction. From Newton's third law, that seems to make sense. They do say there's no fluid friction or that we should neglect it, so there's nothing to stop the raft from going backward. He's going forward, everyone's happy. Let's look at it from the point of view of the law of conservation of momentum. The buoyant force of the water is balanced by gravity, there is no friction, and therefore there are no net external forces. Therefore, locom applies, which means we can write that p total in the beginning equals p total in the end, or p prime total. So let's do that. What are the objects involved here? Well, there's the momentum of the raft, and there's the momentum of the vacationer. If you add those up, they're supposed to be equal to the momentum prime of the raft and the momentum prime of the vacationer. Now, no one's moving in the beginning, so mass of raft, velocity of raft will be zero, and mass of vacationer, velocity of vacationer will be zero. This side of the, <coughs> excuse me, this side of the equation is easy. M raft, V raft, prime plus m vacationer v vacationer prime is a little bit different. What numbers have we got here? The raft has a mass of 55 kilograms. I'm going to leave out units just to speed things up here. And we don't know what velocity it goes with after this interaction. The vacationer at 75 kilograms is moving to the right at 2.3. Now I am going to include the letter let me just move this over here. I'm going to include the letter R for right because as vectors, maybe I can afford to leave out the units, but I cannot afford to leave out the direction. Leaving out direction with vectors is a recipe for disaster. So here we go. We've got 0 equals 55 VR prime. Now plus 75 times 2.3. I'll quickly get my calculator out. Sorry, I don't have it handy, but I will shortly. Here we go. Okay, 55, sorry, 75 times 2.3, I get 172.5. And that is 
to the right. Uh, bring this across, negative 55 VR prime equals 172.5 to the right. Divide by negative 55 gets you VR prime, which is equal to, I get 3.136 negative and right. Now this is a velocity, so the units here of course will be meters per second, even though I left them out, I'm bringing them back in now for my final answer. What is a negative right? It's the same as a left. VR prime, if we sig fig this, probably two sig figs, going to be 3.1 meters per second to the left. Does that make sense with our original analysis? Yes, it does. We predicted that that raft was going to go backward. The law of conservation of momentum tells us that it would. If you leave out the direction, then you won't realize that this negative and that right turn into a left. Things won't make sense. So you know how I'm always saying in class, you got to watch out for sig figs, units, directions, and symbols. Well, all of that is doubly important now because you will get inc incorrect answers if you ignore them. All right. Now there are lots of other examples of interactions like this. In some cases they involve collisions in the traditional sense, like maybe two cars colliding. Uh, but in some cases they involve the word collision really meaning like an interaction. These guys are interacting here. Uh, you'll see some questions where an explosion is described and that also is an interaction in the English sense of the word. Anyway, I'd like to leave you with one last thought, a really neat application of the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, I don't know how many of you recognize this spaceship or this celestial body. This, of course, is the moon. And this is a spacecraft from the Apollo missions where the, uh, the American astronauts landed on the moon. Now, it's really, really cool how this whole thing works. If, you've seen, if you haven't seen the movie Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks, make sure you see that. This is a movie about one of the missions where they actually didn't land because they had a serious emergency soon after um, takeoff on their way to the moon. But you will actually learn a lot about uh, what the spacecraft was like. It's a fairly realistic interpretation and it's very, very well done. Make sure you see this movie for sure, for sure. It's a good one. But the neat thing about this is uh, once they've blasted off from Earth and they've gotten rid of all of their um, excess weight, for example, the spent fuel tanks and whatnot, all that's left for these astronauts is, uh, now I may be wrong, but I don't think so. I think this part here is called the command module, the CM, and I believe in here is the lunar module or the LM, which actually goes down to the surface. This detaches from this and goes down to the surface. And then when they're ready to leave, it goes up and reconnects. I don't know if it makes that noise, but anyway. Um, two astronauts go down to the surface and one stays up here in the command module orbiting. This one, the guy in here never actually gets to land, but I'm sure he's quite happy that he got to go to the moon anyway. What I actually want you to focus on, and this is why I showed it, is this little device here. Let's zoom in on that. If this is a decent enough resolution photo, we'll be able to see. What is that? It almost looks like some sirens or loudspeakers. Well, that wouldn't really make sense. I don't think they went to the moon to broadcast some messages to, uh, to lunar creatures or lunarians or whatever you'd call them. These are actually uh, thrusters. They're tiny little uh, nozzles out of which can be fired some gases in one direction or another. And they're located all around the ship. There's another one. I don't know if you can see the, the next one here. But why are they there? Can you predict, based on your knowledge of the law of conservation of momentum, why would these be on the outside of this uh, spaceship? Take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can figure it out. All right, and you're back. And let's see, did you figure it out? Well, according to what we just did over here, if you've got a combined object, a man and a raft, and the guy ends up going to the right, the raft will go to the left. Well, guess what? 
in a spaceship, it's the same principle. Here, we don't throw astronauts out of the spaceship. We throw molecules of gas. We throw them to the right out of what's called a thruster. We eject them. And as a result, the return force, the reaction force, the Newton's third law force, sends the spacecraft a little bit to the left. These are how they maneuvered the spacecraft into the positions they needed to accomplish their goals, and that is pretty cool. And so that is the fact of the day, the fact that you can use Newton's third law and the law of conservation of momentum to maneuver in space. Isn't that a neat example? I think so. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I will see you in class. Bye now.